Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Greg Durrell, and I'm a partner at a design and branding firm called Hulse and Durrell. Maybe not the most creative name. On the left is my business partner, Ben Hulse. So, growing up in Canada, I was incredibly inspired by all the beautiful logos and symbols which surrounded me every day. But I became increasingly frustrated because I could never find any information behind these symbols. If you want to study the history of Dutch design or British design or American design, there's plenty of resources out there. But for whatever reason, the Canadian story just wasn't really well documented. So earlier this year, I put together a successful Kickstarter campaign to fund a documentary film that I've been working on for five years. And while this was happening, I received a phone call out of the blue, and his name was Dave Mason, and uh, he said, I'm a back of your project, and do you want to come to Chicago to talk at my conference? So I said, sure. So uh, here I am. So today, I'm not really going to talk about the design firm. I'm not really going to talk about the film, although I'll talk about them a little bit at the end. What I really want to talk about today is how obstacles that we face in life are not meant to limit us from achieving our dreams. They're there to make us prove how badly we want something. So I'm going to rewind. I'm going to talk about the 20 years before the five years of this film. So we're going to start in 1988. So I am five years old at this time. And from as young as I can remember, I've had really two big passions in my life, and that was sports and art. So here's some really early drawings. They're kind of terrible. I know I, I totally get that. But one thing that I always remember, and I can remember doing these drawings, and I remember obsessing over the logos. And I mean, it's an absolutely terrible drawing of the Blue Jays logo, but you know, I was trying. Fast forward a year, and my art skills haven't gotten better, but now I'm using mixed media here. <laughs> And uh, one more year later, now I'm making jerseys. And, you know, still, it's so terrible. But, uh, <laughs> but it's so interesting to look back at these things and kind of connect these dots. So I'm going to skip 10 years here because we don't want to see 5 to 15. It gets really awkward in there. <laughs> So in 1998, I had come to the realization I was not going to be an NHL hockey player. I did not possess those, uh, those abilities that those athletes do. So I began to really become interested more in my passion for art. And I was really fortunate in high school, I was accepted into this art program that combined traditional art with technology. Half my days were spent learning English, math, those kind of governmental requirements. And then the other half was about independent study. And they would kind of teach us drawing, sculpture, but also desktop publishing, it was called at that time, audio production, video production. And I got really passionate about like web design and design. This book, Grid Systems and Graph Design, by Joseph Miller Brockman, I discovered when I was 16 years old. And this book is all about the underlying structure that is behind design that you don't see, and how to make information organized cohesively so it's easy to understand. And as I began to learn about design, I began to see the world in a totally different way. And going back to some of those logos that I loved as a kid, this is the logo for the Montreal Expos baseball. And I always loved it. I never really knew why, but now I begin to understand that this logo is made up of a cursive M for Montreal. In the lower left corner, it's an E for Expos. And then the form on the right is a B for baseball. So Montreal Expos baseball. There's so much beautiful information in there, yet it's still so simple. Or the Milwaukee Brewers logo, and you know, it's just simply a baseball glove and a ball, but if you look closely, it's also an M for Milwaukee and a B for Brewers. The Hartford Whalers, same kind of situation. It's like, it's this really interesting play of positive space and negative space, where the negative space forms the H for Hartford, and the green form at the bottom is the W for Whalers. So by 2001, I'm 18 years old now, and you know, I was pretty good at Photoshop and Illustrator and um, sometimes use my skills for mischievous things. So I was 18 years old and I was in a bar and uh, I was sitting at the bar and I'll never forget this. There was a Toronto Raptors basketball game on. They're playing the Chicago Bulls and I just started kind of striking up a conversation with the gentleman sitting next to me and uh, yeah, I told him a little bit what I did and I was interested in design and he took my contact information. I didn't hear from him for about three months. And then I got a call, or got an email, sorry, out of the blue, and he said, I have two friends that run an organization called War Child Canada, and they're looking for a designer. Are you interested? And I was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, let's do this. So I ended up working with War Child for five years, and looking back on it, what was so incredible about that experience is at a really young age, I learned that I could use my skills and interests in design as a way to contribute to social change. We're not just selling cheeseburgers or real estate, you know, we're helping people around the world. I'm just going to show one piece that I did during this time. So this is the cover of an annual report. One day I was kind of looking at the palm of my 
left hand, and in my left hand, I kind of saw the continent of Africa, and the majority of the programming of, from War Child's programming was in Africa, so it just kind of made sense. And again, it's this kind of inspiration of that, the, the foreground versus the background. So 2002, it becomes time to go to university, and I went to the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto. 2003, I dropped out. It just wasn't for me and for the kids out there. I'm not saying a drop out of school. It just wasn't really my path. And what's really interesting about 2003, that was when Vancouver won the bid to host the 2010 Olympic Games, which we'll come up to in a little bit. So 2004, I've now dropped out of school. I have been working for five years at this point, which is pretty amazing. And I decide I'm going to move to Montreal. And because I, I do believe that it's hard to live in the city that you grew up in. And I wanted to experience new things and, and experience new culture. So while in Montreal, I created this website. It was called Work Bureau. And I curated designer-made products. So we made t-shirts, we made buttons. And I also did interviews with practicing designers about what makes design great. While I was living in Montreal, there was all of a sudden, you know, a renewed interest in the Olympics. It was, some, it was a hot topic. And that kind of inspired me to look back into my own backyard a little bit as well. And the Montreal 1976 Games, this logo is so incredibly beautiful. And as I began to learn more about design, I began to be able to decode why I like these symbols so much. So not only is it the Olympic rings that are in the center, uh, it's also a podium that the athletes stand on. And it also has the Olympic track right in the heart of the logo, which is the heart of the Summer Games. Also in 2004, Vancouver launches the logo competition. And I really got to be careful here because I can totally derail my presentation talking on this topic of logo competitions. But really, at the end of the day, logo competitions completely devalue our profession and what we do and what we have to offer. But beyond that, I think they just produce terrible results. Like there's been no great logos or brands that have ever come out of these competitions. And it kind of creates this design by committee approach uh, that is absolutely terrible. And then you have these committees that generally speaking, don't have anyone from a designer or a branding background experience on them. So they're making these really kind of uninformed decisions when these logos and brands have to exist in tens of thousands of applications. But nonetheless, like in 2004, um, I was 21 years old and like it was my aha moment. It was, I, I felt like I had been put on the earth to compete in this competition and I wanted to compete in the Olympic Games. So this was my submission. Looking back on it, there's a couple things that are really terrible about it. The typography is terrible and there's a lot of things I would do differently, but I was you know, trying to play with that same concept of communicating Canada and the Olympics as simply and as efficiently as possible. And I didn't win. Uh, but that was okay because it gave me a dream and something that I wanted, to, I wanted to do with my life. Like, I wanted to be a part of the 2010 Games. This was the eventual winner. It's okay. It's not good. It's not bad. It's kind of like celery. It doesn't really have a taste for me. <laughs> So 2005, so now it's like, okay, I got this goal, this is what I'm doing, I'm whatever it takes, I want, to, I want to contribute to the Olympics. So I dreamed up this idea of creating a children's storybook. And I submitted proposals, I spent about a year writing proposals, and I submitted it to the Canadian Olympic Committee and all the top sponsors across Canada. And the goal of this book that I wanted to make was that children need heroes, but we need to expand the concept of hero beyond the traditional notion of the winning athlete. This book will encourage children to be more active and to take pride in athletic excellence, but it will also encourage them to appreciate and pursue other talents in the field of culture, languages, art, and design. And I really truly believe this because, you know, I realized I could not be an Olympian. I could not do what those athletes do, but if I can use my passion and my interest in design and somehow contribute in a way that kind of makes me like a quasi-Olympian too. But didn't work out. I got some really complimentary rejection letters, but um, there was eight I could, I could count in my inbox. I, I switched emails. I, I think there was more, but there are eight that I find. But yeah, no go. I thought it was a really great idea, but uh, nobody wanted to help me make the book. So 2006, and so at this point, I had dropped out of school for a few years, and my parents weren't like really excited about that. My dad's an engineer, my mom uh, comes from an occupational uh, therapy background, and uh, they never really got what I did. They still don't really get what I did, and they didn't really like that I was this you know, university dropout. So 
I decided I would go back to university and, and try year two. I lasted three weeks, and uh, yeah, I was like, forget this place, I'm out of here. What's also really interesting about 2006 is that Leo Bosbaum becomes design director for the Olympic Games. As soon as I saw this announcement, I immediately looked up his portfolio and it was stunning. And I knew this was my next goal. Like I wanted to be on his team. So over the course of 2006, there were job applications coming up and I was applying to them all. And then I also decided what I would do is because I had that website that I ran that interviewed designers, I would do an interview with Leo about Olympic design. And I was going to ask him the toughest questions I possibly could to show him that I was really passionate about this subject and that I wanted to be on his team. I later found out that uh, <laughs> my questions were so difficult they got elevated to the VP of our department, which is kind of funny. But over the course of that year, nothing happened. I was applying for these jobs and, and I wasn't getting them. So 2007 rolls around and like we're getting close to the games now, right? If I want to have a meaningful contribution to these games, it's, it really is now or never. So I decided I would contact Leo directly and just be straight up. And I asked him like, Leo, I, I really want to be on your team. Like, do you have room for me? And he told me, um, I don't see a fit for you on this team. This was soul crushing because it was a dream that I so desperately wanted to achieve. I had spent three years now um, trying to find a way to, 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 to work on the games, but it wasn't gonna work out. And, and that was okay. Like I was okay with that because I knew I had done everything that I could. So I needed to create some new goals and I had to let the dream go. So there was two goals that I kind of came up with. One was that I wanted to design a book, very similar to that Swiss graph design book that I showed earlier. When you have a really beautiful design book, it's, there's, there's nothing really that gets me more excited than that. And around that time, I was at an art show and I met Burton Kramer, who is one of the most influential Canadian graph designers. He created the CBC logo amongst many, many other iconic symbols and pieces of Canadian design. I met him at an art show and I asked him, you know, have you ever thought about doing a retrospective book on your work? And he said no one had ever asked him. So I was like, hey, like, uh, like I'll do it. And, and he said, yeah. And I was like, all right, sweet. Goal one, I'm like on my way. But um, obviously that's not going to pay me any money, right? So I needed to, you know, find a job I loved. And that was my second goal that I gave myself. Again, I didn't want to sell real estate or, you know, make pamphlets. Like I wanted to contribute and use my skills in a really meaningful way. And I was really fortunate because I found an agency in Brooklyn um, who were all about doing environmentally sustainable projects and helping their clients not only become more environmentally friendly, but also use design as a tool to uh, enhance their bottom line. I had this opportunity. They gave me 24 hours. I mean, we we had great synergy and they said, here's the offer, have a think about it, get back to us tomorrow. And I was ready to say yes right away, but I thought, okay, I'll, I'll wait this 24 hours out. And about two hours to go before the deadline, I got a call from my mom and she said, there's uh, a message on our voicemail and it's from a recruiter at the Vancouver 2010 Games and they want to do a phone screen interview with you. And like a phone screen doesn't guarantee me anything. Like I had spent three years trying to get a job. Like I was broke, I didn't know what I was doing and I had this amazing opportunity in front of me. But I realized that if I didn't do the phone screen that it is something that I might have regretted the rest of my life. So I, I had to politely decline the job. They weren't very happy about that. Neither was I, um, but I took a chance. And you might know where this goes, come in. There it is. <laughs> So I, I ended up getting the job and I found later it's uh, my business partner now, Ben Hulse, who was also a designer on the team. Ben helped convince Leo, I didn't even know Ben at the time, but he helped convince Leo that uh, he saw my portfolio and that I, I should be a contributor. And I'm so incredibly thankful to not only Ben, but uh, Leo as well. And it was an incredible experience. I was one of six designers and we were responsible for everything you would have seen. I mean, we had over 10,000 projects come out of our office and we were responsible for things like the wrap of the city, to the field of play, to all print materials and books. And while I was at the games, I got to design three books, not even one. So I like smashed that dream as well. And it was also cool because we got into uh, three-dimensional objects as well, such as the Olympic torch here. And what was really incredible about 
the Vancouver 2010 Games was that it was a really galvanizing period of Canadian history. It's unlike anything I'd ever experienced. The country really coming together. And this is a photo that Ben took on Granville Street after Sidney Crosby scored the goal in overtime to defeat the Americans and win hockey gold. Sorry, guys. But uh, it, was, it was incredible. And there was this incredible energy around sports in Canada. And I thought I was kind of done with Olympic design at that point. I thought I was done with sports design, really. I wanted to go and pursue other areas of design. And then in 2011, my partner Ben was approached by the Canadian Olympic Committee and asked if he would consider redesigning their brand. And he asked me as well, and, and we thought it was actually a pretty cool opportunity to take everything we learned in this kind of three-year window and condense it down into one six-month project. So really what we discovered was that the community wasn't resonating with the committee. What the community was resonating with was the team. So, I mean, this logo isn't terrible, but th there's a lot of stuff going on here, right? Like, you have this text that runs around that's in English and French, you have the rings, you have the cauldron, you have flame with the gradient, and then you have maple leaf. So we just like cut all that fat, and this is the brand that we came up with. So it's the maple leaf, it's the rings, contained in an oval that kind of is inspired by the field of play. It could be a track, it could be an abstract hockey rink as well. And you know, these, these programs that we work on are so much more than just the logo. If, if you think of a brand as a sentence, for us, like the logo is the dot on the exclamation point. So now here we are seeing it on some Canadian Olympic athletes. We also created this mosaic graphic, which was just really expanding the lines of the maple leaf and interjecting color from the Olympic rings that could be used as part of their identity program. And we applied it on things like, you know, their corporate stationery or it's also been used in environmental graphics. So with this, after the games, like it kind of derailed my, uh, my project with Burton a little bit. Well, it definitely slowed it down. So at the end of the games, we ended up self-publishing his book, Burton Kramer Identities. When it was released, it got like, pretty decent traction and you know I had now at this point uh, I had found that job I loved I had designed not only one book but I'd done four and I was trying to think about like you know what's next for me and naively I thought like you know I really enjoyed this process of making books because you're you're working with text you're working with images you're working with pull quotes illustrations to tell a story and I thought well what about film like I can totally do film so I uh, naively was was the key word there so I asked Burton, if you mind, like, could I do a little interview with him? And he said, sure. So I just put together this two-minute clip. I put it online, and it got an incredible response. And it made me think, like, maybe there's something there of, of this frustration that I had growing up that I couldn't learn about Canadian design. Maybe there's a larger story there. So none of these designers from the 60s or 70s, they don't have Facebook. They don't have portfolios. So I literally had to use the phone book or, you know, Canada 411. I used the online version. But these guys were old school. So, of course, they're in the phone book. So I would find credits on the bottom of a poster and I would look them up. And sometimes I would call them on the right away. I'd get them right away. Sometimes I had to call four or five different people to actually find them. But I would call them up and I would say, I'm a filmmaker, I totally lied. I figured I'd just make it, fake it till I made it. And uh, I wanted to work on this film about graphic design in Canada. And it was incredible, the, the response where they all were like, sure, let's, let's sit down and talk. So now I have to figure out how to make a film. But really the biggest question is like, why? What is it about this film? What's the story in the film? And I spent a couple of years researching about this work and what it was about it. And what was really interesting to me is like coming out of post-World War II in Canada, there was a newfound sense of national pride. You know, up until that point, Canada really considered itself, you know, a colony of Britain. America, for example, gained independence in 70, 1776. And that was like a really like bloody revolution where Canada didn't gain independence until 1867, and it was just basically by a declaration act that everyone signed. I mean, it's like the most Canadian thing. It's like, okay, well, we'll do this really peacefully and sign an agreement, and now we have a country. But out of that, there wasn't that, like, we didn't forge the identity of that, right? Which the Americans did. So when I was looking at this period, and I was looking at the design that existed before the 60s, we had things like the Canadian flag. So this was the Canadian flag up until 1965. And this blew my mind. I mean, I had grown up with the maple leaf my whole life. I couldn't even imagine that we had another flag. And like, look at this thing. Like, it's a British flag, right? And really, coming out of World War II, it was... Canadians had fought together, they had died together, and, you know, it unified a nation. And I think what happened in the 60s was they began to question all these symbols. Like, why is this our flag? 
So I spent a couple years writing proposals, sending them out, and nothing. No one wanted to fund this project, and there's a couple reasons. One, I'd never made a film before, nor had I been to film school. And number two was that this was a design project and not art, which is so absolutely crazy to me, but I didn't qualify for funding because it wasn't an art project. So in 2012, while I was doing all this research and writing, a designer that was on my list to interview, his name was Theo Dimson, passed away. And at that point, you know, a lot of these designers, these real design pioneers in Canada were in their 80s and I decided that's it, I'm done writing grants, I'm done writing proposals, I'm going to do it myself. So I bought the gear. So I bought two SLR cameras, I bought two tripods, I bought, I bought a boom mic, I had a lav mic, and I decided to hit the road. And I had no idea what I was doing. Like the day before I left, I'm literally YouTube, like how to direct a film and like how to, how to shoot video. Like I, I didn't know anything, but you know, I thought like, F it, let's do this. It took me five years, and if you don't believe it, you can watch me age in this uh, video clip here, and you'll see my beard grow. And I made some incredible mistakes along the way. Like, I made, the, I made every mistake in the book. Probably the biggest one I did is I had an opportunity to interview Massimo Vignelli. Uh, for those of you who do not know who he is, Massimo Vignelli is probably the most influential graphic designer of all time. He was born in Milan, moved to New York, and worked on projects from Bloomingdale's to the American Airlines to the entire design of the New York subway system identity. And the day before I went to New York, uh, I was in Ottawa and I was staying with two really good friends of mine and I decided I'd take them out for dinner, we went for sushi and I got food poisoning and I, was inc I got incredibly sick and I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can do this interview tomorrow. I looked into like how much it would cost to move my flight and it was like $2,000 I'm like, all right, I'm doing this interview tomorrow. So they pumped me full of uh, Peptol, Bismol and Advil and gravel and I got on the plane and the biggest mistake I made was like, part of the thing was completely out of focus and overexposed. Like, here I am with, like, the godfather of design, and I've totally, like, screwed this up. But I was lucky because one of the things in that high school program that really resonated with me and what they really hammered home was that you always have to have a backup plan. So I wasn't rolling with just one camera. Luckily, I was rolling with two. So I was able to kind of use the B camera in those moments that the A camera was out of focus, which is just absolutely terrible. Along the way, I did make mistakes, but I was also able to capture some really amazing stuff too. So in this interview, Massimo tells me we're talking about the Canadian National Railways logo. He says, pass me that piece of paper. I'm going to show you why I like this logo. And he then basically takes me to school and begins to break down the logo and the proportions and why he loves that logo. I'm just going to share one other story along the way. But I had the opportunity to meet uh, Patrick Reed, and he was one of the three uh, people that were in the room when they created the Canadian flag. And this was to be the Canadian flag. It has 13 points. It's really beautiful. But in the 11th hour, they had this idea to drop two points, and then that became the flag that we have today. So... 2013, I had started to collect this data, but I had no idea what to do with it. I didn't know how to edit a film. I didn't know how to distribute a film. And through a really good friend of mine, they put me in contact with a film producer who was from Toronto, but living in New York. And her name is Jessica Edwards, and her partner, Gary Huswit, is also a film director, and they've made some incredible films. Helvetica objectified about the design of things around us. I think it was last year or two years ago, Jessica did a film about Mavis Staples, the gospel singer from Chicago. And now with these guys, it's like, okay, cool. I got some content. I got like the experience behind me. We're going to be able to get funding for this thing, right? No, not even close. Again, like this topic of design just seemed to scare everyone away, but at the same time, it made me realize how important it is to make this film. Because if people don't understand what design is, you know, a lot of times in our profession, people complain. It's like, oh, they don't get design. They, they don't pay us enough. Well, that's on us. Like if we don't explain how we can benefit society, that's our problem, not theirs. So 2014 comes along and I needed to make money. So Ben and I had created a company. We had a contract with the International Olympic Committee. Here we are in the Olympic Museum. And one of the projects among many we've been working with them on is the Olympic Heritage Collection, which is a global licensing initiative to create kind of throwback merchandise to past games. In addition to that, we've also been working with a handful of national sport federations because really the thinking is the stronger these brands are, the better partners they can attract. The better partners, the more revenue, more revenue, better opportunity for athletes. So if I told that like little kid wearing the Canucks jersey that you would be designing and helping elevate the Canadian sports brand landscape, he would be stoked. 
<laughs> so to 2017 now, and we couldn't get any funding, but we, it made us believe in the story uh, even more. So what we did is we took it to the people and we created a Kickstarter campaign. This was a video that was made by a guy, Tim Lum. He did a screen recording of him doing the final pledge that took us over to get funding. We ended up raising uh, just shy of 100K. And it was this incredible experience because I had never put myself really out there like that before. Like doing a Kickstarter campaign is so scary. But we had 1,500 backers, many of which I don't even know. And it's so beautiful because they've helped us now achieve this dream. And the film's going to be coming out uh, in the spring. So... When I started this whole project, you know, when you're kind of at these crossroads in life and you're trying to make a decision, they sometimes tell you you got to make a, a pros and cons list. So if I go back to when I wanted to make this film, if I had done that, this is kind of what it would have looked like. I'd never made a film before. I didn't even know anyone who had made a film before. I didn't know how to shoot video. I didn't know how to record audio. I didn't know how to edit. I had no idea how I would even distribute a film. But at the same time, I didn't think anyone else would do it. And I didn't want to lose this really important piece of Canadian history. So I decided I would do it. I want to close today with um, a quote from Steve Jobs. And, you know, Steve Jobs has obviously been incredibly, uh, an inspiring figure in my life. And perhaps maybe I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for his uh, commitment to technology and education. And, you know, it was Apple that, you know, sponsored that high school program that I was in that allowed me to learn the tools. And during those really, really dark periods when everyone was just saying no to me and I was just getting rejection after rejection, there's this one speech he gave in 2005 at a Stanford commencement. And this this was the speech, and there's one line in there that kept me going. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. Thank you very much.